Um, got a paper that has come out from uh, Li Wei Sai and Ed Boyden over at MIT. I think they're still in MIT. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, we covered one of their earlier papers um, on a technique, a technology that actually um, myself, uh, Keith Camito, and Ryan McGarry are working on um, to further the development of um, as a therapeutic for Alzheimer's. Um, and I'm going to share my screen here, um, just introduce the paper briefly, then give a little historical background, and then pop back into the paper. So the paper is... Drum roll, please. <laughs> Multisensory gamma stimulation promotes glymphatic clearance of amyloid. Wow, that's a lot of big words. Uh, Murdoch et al. That uh, published uh, just very recently, 28th February 2024. Um, was received 2022, so on went some revisions. Um, and there's uh, Dr. Liu Sai and Edward Boyden. And... Um, Murdoch et al. With, along with all of these folks here, so this is this paper is a um, a mouse paper. So this uses these five X FAD mice, which are basically um, Alzheimer's model mice, where they basically overexpress amyloid proteins. So you know, I think we we and others have criticized these types of mice um, in this field, but that's neither here nor there right now. Uh, we've talked about it, but people still use these mice in studies. Um, but we can still learn a lot. And a lot of the work that was done on these mice in earlier papers involving multicellular, multisensory gamma stimulation um, has proven to be true um, in humans as well. So, uh, so this is a very promising technology. So there's a lot to unpack here. Multisensory gamma stimulation is a technique that was developed over a number of years. Um, so we have to talk about what gamma means and what multisensory stimulation means. And this term glymphatic, um, that's a new term. And of course, amyloids, so clearance of aggregated proteins that um, are proposed to be one of the drivers, if not the key driver, at least a driver of Alzheimer's disease. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, glymphatic is an interesting term. Um, it didn't exist before 2012, I believe. And I don't know if, what's the term where, um, was it Isaac Newton? Anus Mirabilis, in the year where he published his work. 2012 seemed to be, you know, a, a year where a lot of cool things kind of developed. CRISPR-Cas9 system was actually um, developed as a technology in 2012. And the discovery and coining of the term glymphatic system, I believe, came out in 2012. So, and that's really cool because um, it's the 21st century, and you would think we pretty much have mapped out the gross anatomy of humans pretty, you know, thoroughly, right? So um, it's not like we're going to discover another organ, right, somewhere hiding. Perhaps we will. Um, we certainly, you know, are discovering things of a molecular nature, um, gene functions, so on and so forth, you know, novel ways that the genome is regulated, so on and so forth. So getting getting really down into the into the nanoscale. But, you know, something when it comes to gross anatomy, um, surely we've mapped all this out, you know, at the end of the 20th, 20th century. Um, and it turns out that there's this system in the brain for removing wastes that was, um, uh, wasn't really mapped out until 2012. Um, so I think that's pretty cool that we have this system that was, you know, a, a gross anatomical system that wasn't mapped out. Uh, until fairly recently. So a little bit of background. I mentioned um, multisensory gamma stimulation. This is this term appears again in this paper from 2019. Um, again, from Li Wei Sai and Ed Boyden. Um, maybe he's not. Oh, there he is there. And this is Martorell et al. Um, they published papers that were a little bit earlier than this, 2016. And this work goes back quite a ways to other papers as well. Um, so what gamma refers to is brainwave function, and we'll get to the glymphatic system in a moment. But basically, brain neurons in the brain synchronize their firing. Um, that's kind of a common theme. You can pick it up using electroencephalography, so putting electrodes on your head, not invasively, and picking up basically, I believe, um, electrical changes that are on the surface of your skull. Um, so when you have a lot of neurons firing in mass in synchrony, they form these particular um, patterns, uh, if you will, of uh, uh, 
and bear with me that, that that's a train in the background. <laughs> um, so you have these delta rhythms, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, and they go up higher and higher in frequency in gamma. I believe there might be even higher frequencies, but interestingly, gamma and I believe beta to some extent as well, um, the, the repression of these um, tends to go up, meaning that they get dampened as somebody has Alzheimer's disease. So gamma waves are associated with higher cognitive functioning. I believe also maybe, you know, a rapid eye movement during sleep, as mentioned here. So these, these waves um, can be used as a diagnostic in a way to see whether or not somebody has some sort of pathology such as Alzheimer's. Even more interestingly, um, these waves can be influenced. Yeah, Micah. Can you give a very, very brief description of what exactly it means to have a wave in your brain? Like waves usually are associated with like light particles or oh, yeah, magnetic yeah, yeah. fields. Yeah. What does it mean to have a wave in a brain? Yeah, so, I, so this refers to, I believe, action potential. So if you take one single neuron, one single neuron is kind of, um, it's going to, uh, when its membrane depolarizes, changes polarity um, to a certain extent, it basically um, flips. Um, and this depolarization kind of um, goes throughout the entire neuron and down the axon, and that's considered an action potential. So you basically have, so you can consider that as kind of like one wave or pulse for one neuron. Now imagine if you have millions of them firing in synchrony. Um, so that, that firing rate would be considered a wave, essentially. I see. So, so, so the rate at which they fire is the the hertz basically so if you've got yes a number of firings per second and they all if i understand correctly you can see this kind of at the macroscopic scale right so you can see like the brain as a whole kind of pulsing at this scale is it just is it because they're all firing in sync like you described or is it just that you know when you have 10 million things firing at a certain you know frequency you can kind of deduce that even though they're all firing like at random, inter like they're not all firing. Well, they're, they're they well, at the same time, or are they firing all independently, but at the same rate? Uh, well, they are. They are synchronized in 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 the sense that they you, you wouldn't you wouldn't get this kind of smoothed out wave activity if if it, if it was all like all, right. all of them are stochastic and and these waves i believe um you know it's not like your entire head is going through gamma you know frequencies there's different regions of the brains undergoing different you know so you can pick up right so not only not only do waves change during different times or different you know uh different physiologic responses so alpha waves go up when you close your eyes for example um in your restful state it is mentioned there and it's it happens pretty rapidly um, but different regions will fire, I believe, at, at you know at different waves depending on what sort of what sort of process is happening in the brain. Um, so, so each each region may ha be kind of firing, sort of in sync with each other. So a collection of neurons in an area are all firing kind of on the same um, frequency and in sync. And then some other part of your brain though might be not in sync with that, firing at different rates. Yeah, yeah. So that's right? that's that's my general understanding. So it's a lot like. In a sense, it's sort of like the coordinated firing of um, uh, cardiac muscle cells in your heart, right? They they all basically have to fire in a certain synchronized manner in order to get the blood pumping. Um, so they're right. all undergoing depolarization in like what what can be considered a wave, and you can pick up those waves using using a similar device that's similar to an EEG, but an EKG to basically mm -hmm. pick up. Um, so when they talk about waves, it's really it's really the um, the en mass firing. Of of those gotcha. of those um, electrically conductive cells or electrically reactive cells. And last question on this: Do we know why your neurons seem to like? It makes total sense for your heart to be in sync, right? You want the mm -hmm. whole heart muscle to pump in synchronous. Like you don't want half your cells in your heart to be pumping at a different pace or rate than the others, and you want them all to pump in sync. So it makes total sense. Do we know why the brain seems to have this desire for synchronization in firing, like? My naive assumption, without knowing any of this, would have been that, you know, when one neuron fires, it then triggers the next neuron in line that it's connected to, to maybe reach its action potential in a fire, and they wouldn't be in sync. They would be more in serial, so to speak. So, you know, one neuron fires, and that triggers other neurons that it's connected to to fire, which then triggers other downstream to fire. Um, but the fact that they 
they fire in sync is very fascinating to me. Do we know why? Um, I don't know why. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there's. Okay. I'm sure there's review papers that really speculate on that. But um, but I embarrassingly do not know um, why exactly. And and I'm I'm not really sure why. Um, you would think that neurons, yeah, neurons firing faster. You would it, it would you know things happen in a shorter period of time. So maybe that's why gamma is so fast and it's correlated with you know um, higher cognitive functioning and kind of more mm -hmm. sleepy state is theta. But yep. does that really is that really the correlation? I'm I'm not sure. Um, that, that's okay. sort of sort very fascinating of, stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, and certainly, I you know there, there's there's no doubt like some really deep information buried there that might, you know, highlight consciousness and all sorts of really fundamental processes, right? So these are kind of universal phenomena, these, you know, these um, brain rhythms or brain waves, um, which is basically uh, neurons firing in synchrony. Um, so, so the, this, this firing in synchrony tends to, tends to be off, you know, obviously it makes sense, right? If there's something wrong with neurons, they can't synchronize, they don't fire correctly. Either they fire too quickly or they fire too slowly or they don't fire at all. So that can mess with these rhythms, right? In, in, in these um, models of disease and in humans with disease, do we find that the synchronization is off or is it that the, like, the rate is off? Like, normally you'd want gamma and instead you get beta or something, let's say. Is that what we see? Or do we actually see, like, neurons no longer being able to sync with their neighbors? Well, yeah, I, I think it depends on the pathology. So at least for Alzheimer's disease, at least a number of studies have shown that um, gamma and beta in particular, um, the amplitudes of the of the waves basically oh, I see. goes, the, so the power levels or the amplitude goes down. Right? Interesting. So, okay. so, so there, it's basically, um, uh, yeah. So it's so 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 that would mean so that would mean that there's less of them firing. So the amplitude of a single neuron doesn't really go down; it either fires or it doesn't fire. I see. But okay. but but if there if there's less and less of them firing, then then you basically have would have lower lower rhythms. And, yeah. and I'm guessing the way we measure this um, destructive interference would also come across as decreased amplitude, right? So if you have two neurons, let's say you're measuring two neurons and they're firing opposite each other, so out of sync. We would see that using our measurement tools as just a flat line, right? No, because each one is counteracting the other in terms of how we measure. So we're not measuring per neuron, right? We're measuring overall aggregate. Yeah, I'm. I'm not entirely sure about that, Micah. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more digging um, to see. Um, we, I, I could talk to Ryan about this okay. if he sent me the questions, because he he does. He's he's doing a lot of our EEG analyses, so he would know um, better, like. Like certainly, if certainly if you have if you have some neurons coming in and, and giving an input that would you know suppress the firing of a neuron, then then yeah, then it just trivially goes down. But um, but to answer your question, whether or not destructive interference can be picked up like, like that or, or yeah, recognized like, like the sound levels, waves. If yeah. you have if you have two sound waves and they are exact opposite of each other, they cancel each other out and you get nothing, right? And so I'm wondering if it's due to the way we measure, if we would misinterpret. Um, a change in amplitude as really a change in synchronization where the, they're no longer in sync, so they're firing out of sync with each other, and then that would come across in our instrumentation and, and just due to the method of how we read as cancellation. Because we see one, you know, normally you'd see both of them go up at the same time, both of them go down at the same time, but if one's going up and the other one's going down and then vice versa, then perhaps those two cancel each other out just in terms of measurement. Anyways, we, we can go on the paper. This is all just very fascinating stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, um, I don't, I don't know what the limit. So I'm not an EEG expert, so I don't know what the limitations of of, of the um, of the measurement there is, whether or not you can you can parse that out. So I mean, that's a good question. Um, so so yeah, so the, a lot of things go aberrant, and certainly and beta and gamma and gamma in particular has been kind of a, a point of study for a lot of different labs, a lot of different companies, and this is something that. Um, I've been working on along with Keith and Ryan um, to basically better develop this technology as an Alzheimer's therapeutic. Um, so this paper here, um, this is a follow-up paper, multisensory gamma stimulation ameliorates Alzheimer's associated pathology and improves cognition. Um, basically the, the unique point here is that um, if you non-invasively stimulate a human or a mouse um, with some sort of sensory stimulus at the right frequency, meaning that it falls within the gamma spectrum, 
uh, you can essentially synchronize the neurons. And if that synchronization happens for a while, meaning you turn off the stimulus and they're still firing, it's termed entrainment. So you're entraining the neurons um, non-invasively. By that, I mean uh, a flickering light or a sound that's basically humming at a certain frequency. Um, or it could be it could be a vibration because we have motor neurons that can pick this up. Um, well, not motor neurons, but sensory neurons in our muscles, um, and those will go to the you know to the proper cortical areas of the brain. Uh, so, like the visual cortex, for example, and that'll induce the neurons to fire at that frequency. So that's interesting. But what's even more interesting <clears throat> is by doing so, uh, it seems that you can reverse or slow down um, some uh, consequences of Alzheimer's disease. So um, at least in their mouse models, they showed improved plaque clearance, um, improved cognition, and they've extended this to kind of small scale human clinical trials. So improved facial recognition, for example, um, I believe the result also that there have been some MRI studies showing um, lower incidences of, of plaque in human subject brains by essentially using this non-invasive gamma stimulation so you know light sounds at the right frequency um uh for for participants for you know i believe the protocol some of the protocols are like an hour a day or 30 minutes a day for a week or two a couple of weeks um and then you do follow-up cognitive assessments um so this is really cool for a lot a lot of reasons number one it's non-invasive number two it seems pretty safe because you're just using lights and sound uh, number three, it seems to be having a positive effect on Alzheimer's disease that's translated into humans as well. Um, so uh, really, we don't have anything on the market right now that's really effective to treat Alzheimer's disease. So if something that's basically a non-pharmaceutical intervention um, could be optimized, uh, which is what we're trying to do in our studies to optimize this, this um, treatment modality, um, could put a dent in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I, I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that that would be a, a game changer. Um, and it would be really, you know, groundbreaking for, for humanity. Uh, it goes without saying, right? Um, so further studies obviously need to be done. Um, in the earlier paper, they showed that at least in mice, um, certain uh, glial cells, so cells that were... Um, phagocytic, uh, I forget which class of cells, but basically the cells that get activated in brains um, promoted plaque clearance. So essentially you had, um, uh, you had macrophage-like cells that essentially scavenged, um, you know, as a result of gamma stimulation um, for, you know, somehow the signals are transmitted, you know, to, to other cells that would promote plaque clearance. Um, this more recent paper here um, takes it a step further and suggests that um, this multisensory gamma stimulation um, could also pro promote this uh, so-called glymphatic system to also help flush away these toxins, these amyloid plaques. And then the you know then the question you all might have is, well, if you haven't heard of it, what is the glymphatic system? And that is a really cool discovery from again, around 2012. So uh, just a little bit of background here on, whoops, this paper here. It's gonna come up, there we go. So this is from, I believe the News and Views article that covers uh, the paper here. So what's happening in this paper um, when you do this gamma stimulation? Uh, so actually, well, let me go back and say, what's the glymphatic system? So you've got cerebrospinal fluid, which is this fluid that sort of bathes, um, you know, your, your brain. Uh, it's kind of cushions it, right? So it, it kind of acts as a shock absorber, but also acts as sort of a fluid that basically exchanges nutrients and wastes as well. Um, it's located, you know, in a variety of sort of um, areas or zones uh, that are sequestered from this, um, uh, you know, the space, the interstitial space where the neurons are, um, and it uh, surrounds arteries and veins, and basically this area is called a periarterial space or perivenous space, um, and you have this blood-brain barrier, but you also have this barrier around these spaces here that are formed by astrocytes, so these glial cells, so glial are ba basically supporting 
uh, non-neuronal cells in the brain um, versus neurons that do sort of all the firing and, and whatnot. So the cerebrospinal fluid in these spaces can leak out and going from basically the periarterial space around arteries and flowing through the interstitial space into the perivenous space, uh, basically flushing out waste products, right? So this, so this system here, um, where this is occurring, and this is a kind of a better image here, where you could see these astrocytes forming sort of like these tubes around the endothelial cells that surround, you know, the veins and the, and the arteries. And this space here is basically where you would have neurons, but essentially they're forming, you know, these glial cells, which are um, astrocytes are forming this other barrier. So you essentially have um, your um, cerebrospinal fluid passing through here and then taking up any anything that might be problematic and removing it. Um, so, you know, in this efflux area, which is around veins. Um, and this is mediated or promoted by these channels called aquaporins, um, which are basically abbreviated here. This one specific one, AQ, AQP4. Um, and this goes back to this paper that came out in 2012 uh, by Ilif, I believe it's Ilif, Ilif et al, Jeffrey Ilif, um, at the Nettergaard Laboratory. Uh, paravascular pathway facilitates CSF flow through the brain parenchyma, which is basically the area where neurons are, and the clearance of interstitial solutes, including amyloid beta. Um, so this paper here is where the term glymphatic system, I believe, was coined. And it's basically, um, it's basically a mashing of lymphatic and glial cell. So glial cells, the astrocytes that are mediating this process, um, and this fluid eventually drains into the lymphatic system. Um, so that might be shown a little bit more clear um, in this slide here, which pertains to the more recent paper. So here we have these aquaporin channels, which promote um, water um, to flow out of the cerebrospinal fluid and ions being released by um, neurons. And this is sort of mediating this transport process. So you have this kind of bulk flow of fluids and um, aggregated proteins, hopefully, um, into the perivascular space around the veins, and that connects to lymphatic vessels, which drain out, essentially, and take the wastes out. So glial cells, lymphatic system, lymphatic system. So um, <clears throat> this is, I think, a pretty big deal, um, because, well, number one, it's, it's uh, kind of a a new gross anatomical feature that nobody else seemed to have realized. And number two, if this proves to be important, as I think it will, in ameliorating Alzheimer's disease and treating Alzheimer's disease, um, then I, I think it's a pretty um, easy bet to say that um, Nettergaard or others that basically um, put this anatomical feature on the map, so to speak, are probably going to get Nobel Prizes, right? Um, and this kind of leads to historically an even earlier paper um, from 1992, actually goes back to 91, by Peter Ager, who first isolated these types of water channels in red blood cells and also renal cells, um, basically cloned it, um, put it in Xenopus lavis, which is a frog oocytes, and showed that essentially that these this, this chip 28 protein is a water channel. Um, and I put this here because he won a Nobel Prize for this, right? So um, when you read this paper, you're like, oh, you just cloned something, you won a Nobel Prize. Um, well, if you clone something and it turns out to be medically relevant um, and drugs can be developed to basically act as diuretics and essentially modulate, you know, um, the flow of water in your cells, which is important in medicine. Um, once that happens, then <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're pretty much in line for a Nobel Prize. So I think the same thing is probably going to happen with the glymphatic system. That's my prediction. Um, happy to take bets. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. So that, might, that was my historical overview and background. Any questions? It was very good. Did you rehearse that? Um, no, I didn't actually rehearse it. <clears throat> I, I saw I saw the glymphatic system, and I re I remember reading uh, 
I remember in 2012 or 2013, a follow-up paper that showed that it was active at night during sleep. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I've never heard of the glymphatic system. It's like, how come I didn't read about it in my textbooks? I'm like, oh, it's because it was just discovered that year. <laughs> um, and Peter Ager's paper, that was a paper I've done with my class for a number of years um, talking about um, uh, channel proteins, aquaporins. So then when I saw the glymphatic paper and that I saw aquaporins happened to be a key driver of clearance here, I kind of put two and two together and said, oh, well, all of this is all, all becoming connected. So. Yeah, so I'm trying to think who it is who's working on um, like the whole idea of the brain washing and draining itself uh, via the crib reform plate, which um, some of those those channels, I believe, pass through. Um, I'm trying to think who's uh, developing. Yeah, we had somebody in our in our conference. Yeah, we had somebody in our conference. Yeah, we had a we had a somebody in our conference that basically was looking at um, better drainage into the lymphatic system. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that that paper there that I just showed that was I think that's the that was the first paper um, Nettergard um, Laboratory from 2012 where where they they mapped out and coined the term lymphatic um, in mice. So yeah, um, so very cool. Yeah, they were going to use a, an approach like fitting almost like a stent mm. to stop the, um, to stop the, uh, the actual cribriform plate, the little holes closing as you get older. Um, because apparently that's what happens and then it cuts it off. So, um, I mean, something simple like a low tech stent solution might work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, it certainly, you know, when I, when I read this, I, it, it you know, um, Micah, you had a ton of questions about like, and I still, I also have the same questions about, um, synchronization of neurons firing, but also kind of interpreting data that seems to be, um, paradoxical at times, right? So we know that we know that amyloid levels in general go up with people of Alzheimer's, but then not all people with high amyloid levels get Alzheimer's, right? So uh, and and maybe it's a consequence of how you measure amyloid levels, because I know you can measure them in blood now, and you could certainly measure them in cerebral spinal fluid. But you know, it could be paradoxically that people who have high amyloid levels um, uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid, or maybe the blood, have a very well functioning lymphatic system. So they're clearing those out. So even though you have, you're detecting high levels, they're not in the regions where the damage could be happening, which is stuck in those parochymal spaces, right? Where the, where the neurons are. Um, or maybe I'm just wrong. I don't know, but, um, but anyway, um, things to keep in mind. All right, so we've had a lively discussion here and we haven't even opened the paper yet. Um, so there's a lot of, so that's, that's the background. And like I said, just to plug what we're doing here, um, uh, I and colleagues are, are also trying to develop this technology and optimize it for, um, um, for, uh, Alzheimer's remediation, just because, um, based on everything that I've seen, um, I think it's, I think it's got a really, really decent shot of working. Um, and it's non-invasive, it's safe. Um, and at least the very small trials that have taken place right now suggest that, um, that we might be on the right track here. Uh, is it? Oh, Lucadia with the Kruber form sheet. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> so let me share my screen. All right. So hopefully now some of this terminology makes sense. Multisensory gamma stimulation promotes lymphatic clearance of amyloid. Um, so there's a lot of work that came into this paper, but, you know, um, I guess the, you know, the punchline is very, um, very terse here. It's a mouse model. Um, so there's four figures. There's a bunch more, you know, in the, in the supplemental. Um, but just want to touch on the kind of the key features here. So when they do these, so just as controls, um, no stem, 8 hertz, 40 hertz, 80 hertz. 40 hertz tends to be the kind of the peak um, level of stimulation for um, 
efficacy. When I say efficacy, I mean promotion of um, amyloid plaque clearance in mice. Um, although 80 hertz is also within the spectrum of gamma, um, I don't recall why 40 hertz is optimal. People seem to have zoomed in on, eight, on 40 hertz, although other papers have shown that for humans at least, um, other frequencies within gamma like 35 hertz or, or um, uh, not, not just 40 hertz, but might be more efficacious. So there is individual variation, but for, you know, um, for whatever reason, um, 40 hertz seems to be the one that seems to work. Um, seems, seems to work good enough for most people, but seems to be optimal for mice. And 80 and 8 don't, so they're, they're basically used as negative controls. Um, so these are, so they're stimulating these mice. Um, and figure one is supposed to show that um, the stimulation is dependent on aquaporin 4. So this basically this aquaporin channel. So what do they do here? So it's a little bit kind of difficult to read some of these, but uh, D54, D2, I believe is an antibody against amyloid plaques. Um, and this core and this halo is supposed to represent, so this is a region of the brain they're looking at. So these are confocal ZSAC reconstruction. So frontal cortex of six month old 5X FAD mice, right? So these are your, um, your Alzheimer's disease transgenic mouse models. So what this is supposed to show is that, um, I believe they've, they've done these experiments before, but this is just demonstrating that 40 Hertz stimulation um, you have less of these core aggregates of amyloid. So this is from amino histochemistry here. Um, and this is, you know, this is your data. This is how it appears, um, you know, a bit of an overlap, but here's your p-value. Um, I don't know exactly how many mice were used in this. So each of these circles is probably a single mouse. So looks like about a half a dozen mice for each, uh, each experiment here. Um, so as we've seen in earlier papers, 40 hertz seems to you know, promote plaque clearance, but how exactly does it do it? Um, what they show in figure C, uh, so here they're tracing, uh, I believe, lymphatic flow. Uh, so this is a, um, uh, so they inject, um, I have a slide for this, or C on this. Uh, so. CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid tracer, so OVA647, so some sort of chemical compound that's fluorescent. I'm um, going to stop sharing here and share another slide because there's some anatomy stuff. Uh, oops. Okay, so you should be able to see this. So in a human, base of the skull here, so you've got these cavities where your cerebral spinal fluid is sort of bathed, bathing your brain. Um, and it's isolated by astrocytes away from the interior parts, which is the interstitial fluid area where all the neurons are. So this, this pocket here is the cisterna magna, which correlates to this spot in the mice, right? So basically, uh, that's where it is. So if you inject some kind of a tracer compound here, it will basically flow through the CSF and maybe get into some of the brain regions, right? So I'm going to stop sharing here. So, oops, let's go back to the paper here. Okay, so that's what they do here. This OVA 647, they inject it into this cisterna magna region of mice, um, and they do no stim, 8 hertz, 80 hertz, and 40 hertz. And you can see just from this picture here, you could see um, more flow. So this tracer gets deeper into these brain regions, um, <coughs> which seems pretty significant, the CSF signal. So, so it seems that you have more kind of fluid transport happening. Um, to these to these areas after they've injected this this tracer um, uh, certainly looks pretty impressive on this bar chart here and on this image here um, and what they do in E is that they try to also implicate I believe aquaporin channels and E is a inhibitor 
see in the lecture example. Uh, TGN020, um, I believe that's that's an inhibitor of aquaporin for a chemical. I just got to double check to make sure I'm correct about that. These are not compounds I'm familiar with. Uh, Ovalbumin, whoops, Lexafor 647. Uh, where is impairing AQP4 function using the small molecule TGNO20? Okay. So I believe that's like an antagonist of aquaporin-4. So, so when they use this antagonist to aquaporin-4, um, saline, control here, 40 hertz, no stem, D5, 4, D2, which is essentially, um, again, a stain for um, amyloid uh, proteins. And using this inhibitor of aquaporin channels, um, it seems to block or, you know, abrogate the effect of 40 hertz stimulation as basically summarized in this bar chart here, which is basically quantifying what we're seeing um, on the left side. So the authors are trying to implicate aquaporin-4, um, and they basically take it a step further. So this is a chemical inhibi inhibition of aquaporin. Um, I believe they mentioned that this TGNO2 is not so very specific for this particular aquaporin, so it was not really clear if it's exclusively through aquaporin-4. So what they do is they make this AAV5 viral vector with either GFP and LAXZ as a control or this small hairpin RNA, this inhibitory RNA for aquaporin-4. Um, that's a little bit more specific um, injected into this region of mouse brains um, and do stimulation or no stimulation and essentially run the same experiment as they did in E and they show that blocking of um, aquaporin-4 versus having a non-specific vector um, tends to, you know, depress uh, the clearance or the, you know, the buildup or, you know, depresses the clearance of, of, of amyloid plaques as detected using this D5, 4, D2 antibody. Um, so the implication here being that, um, you know, you have less cerebral spinal fluid flow and that may be tied to less activity of these aquaporin-4 channels that have already been um, kind of correlated with um, uh, increased fluid flow throughout the glymphatic system in that earlier paper that I cited um, from 2012. So that is the takeaway from figure one. Any questions? Okie doke. On to figure two. Figure two, uh, more anatomical stuff. So um, another way that this lymphatic system actually kind of promotes clearance is that um, when this is all happening, so this is kind of an integrated system. There's, you know, obviously to survive, a lot of things have to be happening at the same time, right? We tend to comp compartmentalize things, but you know, you've got you've got your aquaporin four channels that are opening up to allow you know water flow um, and other solutes salts to go through, um, but that's aided also by the pumping action of your um, of your veins and arteries, right? Or particularly your arteries. So by them flexing and arteries do flex, they're surrounded by smooth muscle. So that's that's a common thing for all arteries. Um, you know, it improves fluid flow, essentially. So what they're looking at here is that when they do 40 hertz stimulation, um, they note that when they inject these tracers, so this is a, you know, I believe it's some two photon microscopy stuff happening here, visualization of this area here, so um, vascular map. So vein ones, so they look at blood vessel diameters and artery one. So these, these peaks up and down are essentially the artery kind of stretching and closing, right? As, 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 um, as blood is flowing and you have no stimulation, eight Hertz, 40 Hertz and 80 Hertz. So this is basically, I believe an increased rate of stimulation happening. So as at peak 40 Hertz, um, gamma stimulation, uh, they tend to know more what they refer to as vasomotion, or I believe that's the term vasomotion, uh, meaning more 
you know, more expansion and contraction uh, of the diameter of this artery is happening, um, you know, um, either after 40 hertz or, you know, or, or, or yeah, after 40, 40 hertz stimulation or during 40 hertz stimulation um, versus the controls. Yeah, Micah. Uh, can you just remind me, are these well type animals or 80 models? Um, good question. These are, I believe, yeah, these are 5X FAD uh, mice. Okay. Yeah. So do you these know, are, yeah. do they happen to test wild type in this to see if you get similar results with simulation in all these places, or do they only test the AD mice? Uh, good question. Um, very good question. Um, it looks, I'm going to say just 5, 5X FAD mice. Um, That's unfortunate. Yeah, um, I'm just looking right here. Number of peaks after one hour non-invasive simulation in six-month-old 5X FAD mice. Um, yeah, yeah I'm curious if this, if a lot of the stuff they're seeing is just, you know, generally 40 hertz stimulation is good for healthy normal mammals, or if this is specific to the 80 model. Yeah, um, you know what? I don't know. It might. It, they, uh, that would be a very important control, would it not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they, if they, if maybe they have it in the in the supplemental, um, I'm not sure, but it's not here. It's not in Figure okay. Two. Um, maybe they even mentioned it somewhere and said, uh, yeah, we 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 corroborated this with wild type mice as well. But I, I don't recall reading that. So um, okay. Um, perhaps they did not. Okay. So on to three. Um, so uh, what can I say about this? So this is basically single nuclear RNA sequencing of basically thousands of different nuclei. So they did RNA seq of a whole bunch of different cell types that are found in the brain, um, astrocytes, endothelial cells. Um, all these abbreviations are down below in the figure. So number of differentially expressed genes. So whenever you see a map, whenever I see a map like this, I'm like, am I expected to actually absorb the information here? Uh, because this is sort of, you know, you've got a lot of things going up and a lot of things going down, right? So then you need to go into your databases and see, well, what's relevant that's being expressed up and down. Um, and they, I believe from this, they pull out some, some candidate proteins that are uh, found in astrocytes that are in important for kind of the flow of fluids, um, one of them being an ion channel, KCNK1, which is a potassium ion channel um, found in astrocytes that's implicated in, I believe, um, uh, promoting um, kind of lymphatic flow, and of course, aquaporin-4 as well. Um, so I think out of all these candidates, they, you know, they looked at KCNK1 as, as one um, one example, I don't know why, why this one, why, why this one was looked at and, you know, in this figure, maybe that was just taken as a representative of, of others. Um, but when they look at, you know, astrocytes and the expression level of this RNA, um, 40 hertz gamma stimulation tends to promote more of these potassium ion channel um, being essentially expressed in the cells. Um, and we've seen this before again, um, aquaporin-4. 40 hertz stimulation in uh, so which so mouse prefrontal cortex astrocyte endofeet magenta so um, astrocyte endofeet so those are those parts of the astrocytes that kind of wrap around um, the blood vessels um, and that's where you tend to get the aquaporin for expression um, clustering so after stimulation you have more aquaporin channels um, and these other ion channels expressed as well um, in astrocytes so. Again, that's that's um, I think that's the most relevant information that we can glean right now. Um, and in Figure Four, um, this is kind of interesting. Um, so there's uh, so there's a neuropeptide um, as distinct from neurotransmitter, a neuropeptide that's called VIP one, which I'm not really too sure how it connects specifically to um, lymphatic clearance, um, but they mention it here. Uh, so VIP interneurons, upregulate transfer neuropeptide synthesis. So um, that's implicated in um, lymphatic clearance. Um, so let's see, VIP1 is a 28 amino acid peptide that's thought to be released by VIP interneurons during high frequency stimulation. 
VIP is associated with attenuation of Alzheimer's disease pathology uh, and prostaglandin um, and is known to act synergistically with VIP to regulate vascular cells and blood flow. So, so they're now looking at this um, neuropeptide, VIP1. I'm just going to pull my slide here. So can you see my screen sharing? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so neuropeptides versus neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters, I think we're all familiar with. Um, you have an action potential reach the end of your, your axon. You have these vesicles packed with these chemical signaling molecules, such as acetylcholine, GABA, whatever. Um, and once this happens, these vesicles fuse, you have a release, and you have these ionotropic receptors. So meaning that these neurotransmitters bind to these receptors, cause them to open, um, these channels to open, and you have a, now another membrane depolarization event that happens here. So your signal jumps this little gap, right, the synaptic cleft. So it's a really short distance. So that's how neurotransmitters uh, work. Um, also, I believe you need to have a fairly high concentration. So the binding constants are sort of in the micromolar range or millimolar range. Uh, neuropeptides are a bit different in that these vesicles um, so depolarization promotes vesicles from basically fusing, but these neuropeptides um, act a bit differently. Um, they bind much more tightly to their, to their, um, to their ligands, which happen to be G protein coupled receptors. A, they diffuse um, a little bit more, you know, they diffuse, diffuse a much longer distance um, and their effects are a bit longer lasting as well. So this is like another way that neurons communicate. So this is sort of more like, um, uh, what's the term? When you have, um, ah, forgot the term. But when you basically have um, intercellular signaling happening, where you have essentially um, a, uh, you know, something released uh, in, into the microenvironment and it binds to another cell and stimulates it. So this is very common in, in the immune system, for example. Uh, yeah, Micah. Are we supposed to be seeing something other than the figure in the paper of the big chart? Sounds like you're describing something other than what we're seeing on the screen share. Um, are you seeing? We're looking fast in the paper. No. Oh, oh, why is it not? Huh, that's weird. Okay. I've seen that last figure you were talking about with the big heat map. Mm, oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me stop. Huh. That's weird. Sorry about that. Um, I did click on my PowerPoint. You're having some glitches here with. Okay, yeah, this looks very different. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, okay. So you guys must have been totally confused. Uh, nothing was nothing was matching what I was saying. I was pointing to God knows what. All right. So this is what I was referring to. So on your left, you when we have uh, neurotransmitter transmission action. So this is this blue kind of nub here is supposed to be the end of your axon. Uh, this is the business end of your neuron, or at least the opposite business end. So this is where your neurotransmitters are released. And here are your ionotropic receptors. So very short distance, fast signaling, fast vesicle recycling. So this is where, when we talk about, you know, um, brainwave activity, and we talk about neurons firing action potentials, this is what we're referring to. Uh, neuropeptides are another form of signaling. So it's a release of signaling molecules that diffuses outwards. Uh, it doesn't really go into, you know, necessarily a synaptic cleft, but basically binds to receptors uh, and modulates a whole bunch of things, you know, essentially, um, you know, a longer, longer kind of and more distant communication um, that neurons basically undertake by releasing these chemical, you know, signaling molecules um, that bind much more tightly to their ligands, such as G protein coupled receptors, and essentially modulate um, the activity of neurons. So you could sort of, you could sort of consider, I guess, neuropeptides to be um, a way to modify how well a neuron can respond to neurotransmitter signaling, as well as respond to other things in its environment, right? So, so changing how it qualitatively behaves, you know, in reference to other neurons. So, and one of these neuropeptides, VIP, is implicated. It, it tends to be expressed uh, during gamma stimulation and tends to have 
beneficial effects on neurons for glymphatic clearance. So let's go back to the paper here. When we, when we say stimulation, we're talking about things like either an auditory or visual stimulation? Yes, flashing lights. Is, so in, in this, in in this the, specific this case paper. here, in this paper here, we're talking about sound and light. Yeah. Both, both at the same time and the same frequency? Yes. So, and so, this is uh, binaural, so I'm assuming, actually, they're mice, so it's probably not binaural. Yeah, I don't think it's binaural in this case. Um, so, so we know the, this, this is what, sorry, my, my understanding is that to get the auditory stimulation, you needed it to be um, binaural. Is that not true? Can you actually get stimulation through auditory means just through like a beat? Yeah, so, so that's a good question to see whether or not it's qualitatively different. So we're actually doing some of these studies ourselves, but um, so binaural... So there's, there's a couple ways that you can achieve binaurality. One of them is basically having two frequencies, sort of um, two yeah. different frequencies. And then, and then that beat, that binaural beat you actually mm -hmm. quote unquote hear doesn't exist out in the real world. It exists, yeah. it's being generated by your brain. Um, yeah, that's what I'm in, familiar with. Right. But in this case here, what they're doing here is um, not binaural. They're actually playing clicks at 40 hertz. So basically there's a certain carrier frequency and you're basically hearing... I have a sound generator here somewhere, but basically it's just basic, just like a staccato, mm -hmm. staccato clicking of 40 hertz. All right. And um, does, is that yeah. shown previously to result in um, synchronization like we see with the binaural? I, I haven't looked at this for a very long time. At last I did look at it, which is like a decade or two ago. Yeah. Binaural stimulation had a very strong synchronization effect, whereas just an external, you know, both ears hear the same thing beat didn't but maybe again this is very long ago maybe things yeah. have changed or maybe i just remember yeah it's i think it's what i mean what you're kind of homing in on are very like good fundamental questions like what's what's the what's the what's the optimal way to entrain neurons yeah. to a whole bunch of external sensory stimuli and binaural is qualitatively different than monaural like clicking that's outside mm -hmm. right so it's it's it, it would be engaging different regions of your brain um and yeah, there's a lot of questions there, right? So how, you know, um, you know, how much overlap can there be with different stimuli as well? Because so what, what the uh -huh. authors here are doing are, are sound and light, but I think a more recent paper, they also published implicated vibration as well, which makes sense because, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, out of all the, all the sensory stimuli that you can non-invasively use to entrain for certain frequencies, you know, sound, light, and Vibration are the only three I can think of. You can't really do taste. You can't really do, you know, um, you know, other other kind of stimuli. Smell, yeah. S smell, right? You can't pulse smell, you know, like, like not that. at forty hertz. <laughs> right, right. So, so, um, so the, you're you're limited to those. And how how do those different frequencies like um, also uh, interact with one another? Right, because you're, you're mm -hmm. initially stimulating different cortical regions and. Yeah. And is there and and some of their earlier papers, at least in my show, that you can have have some of these um, oscillations spread to other other brain regions. So, uh, long story short, there's so many more experiments that need to be done to really kind of figure yeah. out what's what's happening. Um, and that's kind of what um, myself, Keith, and, and Ryan would like to do is is to see if we can expand this into a trial that involves thousands of people, if not you yeah. know more so, because right now the data that's being collected. Although it's extremely promising, you know, you're talking about small groups of people, like you know, like mm -hmm. one one set frequency, one set you know protocol for like a couple of dozen people, right, for a few months, yeah. and you know, uh, so we, we don't really know how binaural beats would would, would you know would play into this, um, and mm -hmm. and other types of stimuli. Yeah. yeah, there's also the issue of if you're doing uh, audio and visual light simply travels faster than sound, right? And depending on where the audio source is, even though they might be in sync, if the audio source is far enough away from the organism, you may end up with that audio beat off from the light beat, just in terms of when the, the beat hits the ear versus when the light hits the eye. And so you could end up potentially as a destructive, again, if these, there is such thing as destructive interference in this case. Um, I also wonder, do you know if anyone's done whatever the equivalent of binaural for the eye is. So you'd like have a different light source on each eye and they pulse opposite, same way you do a binaural beat, but. I've never like, heard, I've never heard of that. 
Um, you could you could totally do it with modern VR headsets because modern VR headsets have a different light source for each eye. Like each eye sees an independent screen, and so uh, uh, just thinking of like tech that people already have in their home that you could potentially leverage to similar to headphones, you could potentially get people you know to get a visual uh, oscillating visual what through each eye independently would be interesting to see if that entrains better. What would that mean? That if you like flash at a certain frequency, blue and, and red, you're just seeing purple, or something like that? I'm thinking it's like the binaural beats. You have the you have alternating beats, so your left ear hears something offset from your right ear, and then that kind of meets in the middle, so to speak, right? And you get a, a that we described earlier of that beat that you hear in your brain doesn't exist anywhere else, right? Because it's just you have uh, two frequency, two different frequencies in each ear. I wonder if you could, I don't know, Maybe it's a color thing. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's like you're flashing at a certain rate, and you flash at two different rates, and then the rate in the middle is what you entrain at. Again, trying to think of how you would do something similar to the binaural thing, but with eyes, and yeah. with that entrain. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. Long, long story short is I don't know. I mean, there, there's a, another paper that came out fairly recently that that showed that um, you know some people. People can entrain better at some frequencies of light versus others. So, so pulsing at a frequency. So, in, by frequency in this case, I mean the color of the light, right? But, but the pulse being the the hertz that it's being pulsed. So, so green and red are better than other frequencies, which just might oh, interesting might just be because you, your your photoreceptors are more in tune to that yeah. somehow. Um, uh, yeah. So, so there's. There's a lot of variation there, so I, you know, there's there's a lot to be kind of mapped, I think, in this, in the space of, you know, of of brainwave entrainment and the type and the type of stimuli that that are out there, binaural versus non-binaural, different light frequencies, different frequencies in general, individual variation, um, you know, fatigue, for example, right? So so can you keep this up in the entrainment levels? maintain or the oscillations maintain or, or does the brain kind of get tired and then you have to shift to different frequencies um yeah there's there's like so many there's a lot of variables yeah. that still need to be mapped out here um but the the so before we get kind of too lost in and and kind of discouraged in in all the variation there what is encouraging is that you know taking something that we learned from mice and saying well 40 hertz seem to work in mice let's do 40 hertz in humans let's just do a very narrow set of parameters let's not optimize it for individual variation let's just try it out on a group of people um and lo and behold you get statistically significant cognitive improvements yeah um so so despite the fact that this this protocol isn't optimized and you still get measurable cognitive improvements and measurable improvements in lower like amyloid plaques in 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 these small cohorts of people um tells me that this is a an extremely promising avenue to yep. approach um, that that we, yeah, we, that we can really optimize this, you know. Uh, and and I don't know of any other type of drug compound where people just say, well, you know, let's just let's just wing it on a small group of people based on what we learned in mice, and not even use the optimal dosage and see what happens, and it works, yep. right? And you're like, whoa, well, okay, well, if that works, then then we really shouldn't invest much more energy in optimizing this and seeing if if this hypothesis is correct um and also and also figuring out who this would be most beneficial for right like there must be some cutoff that's too late is it good for better for people with mild cognitive impairment is it also good for people with lewy body dementia or other dementias affected is it just alzheimer's disease um you know so there's there's a lot more studies that that need to be done um but i think the results are encouraging enough that we should really go sort of full speed ahead um, and, and, and see whether or not, you know, this is this is something that could be developed as a, you know, and, and never and never mind a standalone, right? So this this might actually does this synergize with other Alzheimer's drugs as well? You know, will 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 this type of therapeutic in conjunction with other therapies improve the efficacy of those therapies, right? Because if if this mechanism is correct, if this 40 hertz type stimulation or this gamma stimulation or maybe maybe even beta stimulation, if it if it is working through improving lymphatic clearance, well that's a very fundamental mechanism that might synergize with drugs that target amyloid plaques, right? So that would that would 
suggests to me that this is that this would be a very powerful additive approach um, and might boost the efficacy of things that are out there. Anyway, enough rambling. Well, let's go back to uh, let's go back to Murdoch et al. So they look at this VIP protein. Um, again, I'm not exactly clear how this neuropeptide functions exactly to um, kind of boost the glymphatic system. Um, it's buried in there somewhere, but it does. Um, and what they do here is they try to, uh, I believe, knock down the activity of VIP. And how do they do this? They have this, um, uh, they have these 5X FAD mice uh, that are expressing this, I believe they're expressing something that inter in inhibits VIP um, in, the, in conjunction with a drug. It's kind of a little bit complex, but let's see, how do they do this here? Uh, causally determine whether VIP interneurons are related. We chemogenetically inhibited VIP interneurons using PHP EB AAV, so AAV vector that's expressing this dohm 4 dim cherry. So that's a, your fluorescent tag, so you can see that it's there. Um, so HM4D1 ligand, uh, clozapine and oxide. So let's see, so this, so they add this drug, which binds to this HM4D1. And I think somehow this binding causes it to block VIP um, somehow inhibits. So maybe it, maybe it's a, maybe it's a like, maybe it's a receptor for VIP. And then in response to this ligand, it, it basically now shuts it off. So it's this chemogenetic system, right? So basically expressing an inhibitor of VIP that only inhibits when you add in this um, clozapine and oxide. And if anybody knows more specific details on how the system works, I'm all ears. Um, but that's the system that they developed to basically um, knock down VIP. Why didn't they use small nuclear or why did they use some sort of, you know, RNA interference or something else? I don't know, but that's, that's the technique they used. Um, so here is VIP. <laughs> I just love the names of these fluorescent proteins, tomato and M cherry. Um, but essentially this, this is your control. This VIP HM4D1, when you add um, that chemical compound, should basically inhibit. Um, this is basically just oops, ah, visualization of where in the prefrontal cortex region of the brain where they're basically expressing this, you know, the system to knock down VIP. Um, and here's the addition of the CNO compound. So let's see what happens in so. Uh, So it looks like there's some, what is it? So no stimulation and stimulation 40 hertz. So, you know, um, not significant. So, you know, um, slight effect. So, you know, slight decrease, you know, of, of, of clearing, you know, plaques using this D5-4D2 antibody. So that's the data. You can see that for yourself. That's, um, that's what the authors get. Um, and they look at also this vasomotion and what they're showing here is that by using the system to knock down VIP1, um, you know, you basically get less, you know, or no vasomotion in response to 40 hertz. So these experiments here are further tying in this neuropeptide VIP1, which I'm not too familiar with, um, with its function in the glymphatic system, but it's, uh, you know, supposedly has beneficial modulatory effects on the lymphatic system. And, um, and this is the author's data presenting, um, presenting this uh, fact um, and how it is blocking 40 Hertz activity once you um, block the IP, this neuropeptide. Um, okay, so there's a lot more, you know, background information in, in the uh, supplementary data. I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, that's in the text, but basically all of it is in support of the data that we just showed right now. Um, 
I think uh, to your point, Micah, it would be interesting to see this in, you know, wild type mice to see if like this lymphatic response um, with regards to gamma stimulation is is happening. Um, maybe the authors did mention that. Um, somebody, you know, if, if, if I find it, then I'll point it out during our next meeting. But at least in the paper, in the figures that I sh showed right now, it was all 5X FAD mice. Um, so if the glymphatic system is implicated as kind of one of the key anatomical regions, physiologic regions that is, you know, um, affected by uh, these gamma stimulatory modalities, then uh, that's pretty big um, because that's that's affecting kind of a major route for, for, for plaque clearance. Um, and it can tie into, as I mentioned, other, other therapeutic approaches. So my prediction is that, you know, if we do get drugs or therapies that work through this lymphatic system to target not just Alzheimer's, but other dementias, um, then, you know, no doubt uh, the originators of, of, you know, of this uh, physiologic mechanism and this anatomical feature that was termed the lymphatic system, I, you know, I believe somebody or some bodies are, will, will get a Nobel Prize. Um, so we're just awaiting on a drug to validate this as a, as a therapeutic target or, or not just a drug or a non-drug approach. All right. Well, I hope we learned something new today. Uh, yes, I, I found, found all of this very fascinating. The, uh, I'm particularly interested in the, um, you know, the stimulation. I'm not super interested in a new drug um, that solves these problems, but I'm very interested mm -hmm. to see um, just the, the entrainment actually mm -hmm. do something here. Uh, like you said, I would love to see wild type study. I'm kind of suspicious that this maybe has nothing to do with AD mice. This has to do with, you know, it's just a, if you in, have better synchro synchronization, then you'll get better results. Um, that being said, you know, maybe a, a normal, healthy brain already synchronizes really well, and you can't improve on that. Um, but I would not be surprised to find out if you can actually improve on that. Yeah. So, and of course, there's also individual variation in normal, healthy people, right? So, yeah. you know, another another question is 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 do can these non-invasive stimulatory approaches help us get healthier and, and think better, right? Kind of like yeah. kind of like Has working done... out. I was going to say kind of like weight weight weightlifting or working out, right? So, yeah. I mean, you you could be you could be normal like me right now, or we, you could really hit the gym and you know and uh, improve right. massively. And so, does the same apply here with this type of intervention? Has anyone done um, any sort of cognition tests on brainwave entrainment? Yeah, yeah, they have. They've they've done like um, facial recall tests, and and that that is improved. Um, and, in, in, and sorry, in, in, in mice normal too. healthy humans, not uh, disease models or disease humans. Oh, in normal healthy humans, um, I'm not sure. Like mem memory or cognitive capabilities, or yeah, that's any, yeah, any of those sort of things. Yeah, that's something that needs to be studied further. Um, I do think that people have done uh i could pull up some papers for you i, I think people have done other uh, brainwave stimulations that you know might have shown to improve cognitive skills by you know like improving brainwaves associated with certain sleep states um but gamma in particular with normal healthy humans to see if 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 uh if they get a further improvement um yeah, I'm not sure. Um, that's something that I've been kind of looking up as well for, for some of the papers I've been looking up for grants that we're applying for right now. Um, but yeah, if not, then it might be a question of whether or not we, we actually have good optimization happening to, to, to see that effect. What I, mean, what I mean by that is that I, we, we say 40 hertz, but that's kind of shorthand in my opinion, for, you know, for kind of the spectrum. So, so it might yep. be, it might be 52 Hertz might be better for me. Right. So meaning yep. that, that I can get better synchrony and more neurons firing in oscillation, oscillating at 52 Hertz than 40 Hertz. And for you, it might be 40 Hertz. You know? Is there an association with, um, brainwave frequency changes with age? 
Like, do young people have different frequency yeah. patterns? Yeah, I think I think that that shifts, and um, I think you're it. I don't I don't want to I don't want to misspeak and say that it's more difficult to entrain at at later ages, but um, I do know of some papers that show that yes, there there are there are definitely changes in in uh, in brainwave activity um and I, I don't know off the top of my head whether it correlates with like you know um uh power levels or 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 it's more like um kind of missynchronization um but i just want to summarize and say yes there are definitely changes correlating with aging um with with brainwave activity i wonder uh, just purely speculative here i wonder if this can be something where you'll want to do like an EEG when you're young, so you know what your kind of natural uh, frequency is. So that way, when you're older, you can try to entrain towards that frequency, sort of thing. Hmm. Or is this something? Because, like you said, if it's personalized, like everybody's got a different kind of natural state. But as you get older, you perhaps fall away from that. Um, you'd want to get back to your natural state, not you know Micah's natural state. Right. 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 I mean, a more a more easier way to do that if you if you don't have that information is to, again, go through trial and error. Right. Basically, uh, yeah. go through try different frequencies and see 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 where where that where that peak is, and then and then yeah. and, and then see if you can you can you can optimize that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's the more I read about this, um, kind of in, in my own personal researchers that the research is that the more like. Um, the more down the rabbit hole you go, the more you realize how kind of little is known with like basic questions, you know, regarding yep. brain oscillations, entrainment, aging, um, you know, different pathological states, um, and that there's there's just so much room for you know for for publishing new findings. And right now, it feels like this is all black magic and voodoo, or it's like if you would have you know without any data to back it up, you would have made a claim that. Oh yeah, you know, you flashlights in someone's eyes and send random sounds into their ears that make no sense. They, you know, get healthier and they think better and you know sleep better. All these things I would call you crazy. Um, well, it and, certainly sounds new agey, right? Sort of like yeah, it's very new agey. It's very like you know crystals and and magnets, right? Is what it sounds like. Um, but then you look at the data and you're like, well, this data actually seems to hold up reasonably well. Like, and it keeps cut more and more data keeps show, showing that there's something there. Um, but I don't think we're anywhere near having any idea why that is. Like, you know, we have hypotheses and whatnot, but I feel like we're a very long way away from understanding, you know, why we don't even know why your brain cells all want to be synchronized. Like, that does not, like, again, the heart makes sense. It needs to pump in sync. But your brain cells all firing in sync? That doesn't make any kind of sense to me as to why you'd want that. Well, and well, then yeah, I think that's... about how, how does that apply to artificial intelligence that we're building? Like, maybe we should start building our. AI is to fire and sync. Maybe there's a good reason for that. Maybe it does something. Uh, I can't imagine what, because again, it's all black magic and voodoo, but there's something there and it's just very bizarre. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, little, little by little, right. We're, we're filling in those gaps, but what I like about this yeah. approach too, is that it's very, um, uh, it's very, it's not set on a very specific. There's no there's, there's no constraint here as to what the fundamental driver is of Alzheimer's. So, a lot of the problems I think developing a new drug for Alzheimer's is that the you know that I think in in well in many senses the researchers and you know and and the pharma has basically well I mean pharma will focus on drug molecules because that's what they do best, but but they may have given themselves too much of a constraint where they say well let's 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 pay, let's believe that Alzheimer's is caused by the accumulation of these certain beta amyloid plaques oh, and yeah. maybe neurofibrillary tangles, um, and let's basically put all of our resources to finding drugs then that basically target those either antibodies yeah. or some other some other molecule, and if there's any other driver, well. You're, you're, you've, you've locked yourself blinders out on. of it. You've blinders yeah. on, and you've basically you can have a you can have a cure right next to you, and you're like, well, we're not looking there because we have limited yeah. ourselves to to anything that basically hits amyloid plaques. And what I like about this approach here is that it's not you know it could be amyloid plaques, it could be neurofibrillary tangles, it could be some other waste product that's being cleared out by the lymphatic system. Who knows? But what we do know is that at least having this type of stimulation 
has cognitive benefits. Um, it seems to be targeting amyloid plaques, might be targeting other things as well. Um, but it's there's there's kind of less constraints there, and 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 yep. you're sort of you you don't you 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 haven't like narrowed yourself down to these specific mechanisms. So as you're sort of you're open to you're open to you know many other mechanisms at play at the molecular level um, that this system you know that this um, modality could be impacting. Um, so I I like that um, that you're sort of looking at it from more like top down approach rather than you know maybe maybe you know inadvertently you know putting yourself into a dead end uh and spending yep. wasting a lot of resources so so the fact that so the fact that the you know what you're gauging here is whether or not you're getting cognitive improvements i mean fundamentally that's that's really what what you're after right it's like who cares if amyloid plaques are cleared out if you know if the person isn't cognitively improved right i mean that's what you that's what you really want like is is this therapeutic approach going to um improve the cognition of the individual um if it does great success right however it happened right then we could backtrack and figure out how that mechanism was so so this so this approach here is a bit further upstream so um so it you know it uh, to me that that means that there's a higher probability of success because we've already seen in small scale clinical trials that are not optimal um, delivering these types of cognitive improvements right albeit small but still significant so um, that tells me that we're we're you know even though that this is a little bit out there still um, papers like this are certainly cementing the molecular mechanisms right because when you talk about flashing lights and sounds and stuff it seems a little woo woo but if you have a whole bunch of papers backing up saying hey look, it's affecting the lymphatic system. Yep. Um, and it's, you know, it's improving the expression of, of, of aquaporin channels. And this is probably how the mechanism of action is happening. Um, that's a little bit harder than to kind of discount and say, well, it's just some crazy stuff with lights and sounds. Right. This reminds me, uh, I agree with what you're, what you're describing, that people are too focused for AD. And I, I have completely stopped investing in any company now that targets amyloid or tangles or anything like that. Like, if you're going to, only AD targeting companies that I will look at anymore for investment purposes are just companies that are trying to um, solve aging. And as a side effect, they, they cure AD. Uh, for the exact reason you described, I think people are way too focused. And we now have therapies that seem to completely clear amyloid plaques, and it doesn't resolve the AD at all. Like it has no positive effect. Um, this reminds me, though, of Michael Levin has some work where he showed they can um, inject a cancerous cell into know, a tadpole or fish, because he likes working with fish and tadpoles. Um, and you know, normally, this would just grow into a cancer and kill the animal. But he found that when the that cell, one of the features of that cell that they can actually see it before the cell you know is notice otherwise noticeably cancerous is that it disconnects from its neighbors and so it stops communicating with its neighbor cells and so it basically starts acting as its own organism no longer part of a larger organism mm -hmm. and they they also found that if you force it to reconnect to its neighbors it doesn't become cancerous like it still is. You know, it's a P53 mutant or whatever, like it is designed to be a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's connected to its, its neighbors, it behaves appropriately. And it does not do what everybody expects cancers to do, which is spread and become malignant, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if this entrainment is, you know, again, purely hypothesizing and speculating here, but I wonder if this entrainment is something similar where by forcing the cells to get into synchronicity somehow, you're kind of encouraging them to work together as a whole rather than you know, when they're not synchronized, maybe that's suggestive that they're no longer communicating and with their neighbors and behaving in the way that you want them to behave. They're no longer behaving as a cohesive unit. They're now behaving as kind of a more scrambled mess of individuals. Yeah, I mean, and so the entrainment is just kind of, I mean, maybe that's what's actually, you know, maybe the entrainment doesn't clear the plaques at all. All it's doing is just fixing a much deeper problem, which is this uh, disconnecting of all your, your neurons from each other and kind of behaving independently and you're getting them to all work together again as a brain and now you have a more functional healthy brain that then goes back to clearing out what it's supposed to be clearing out i think i think it's i think it's all of the above it might be it might 
and again, it might be some 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 aspects are more important than others. But what you raise there is is basically you know neuroplasticity, which is yeah. your neurons making more connections with other neurons. So that's you know that's part of like long term memory, and 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 when you pick up new information, uh, your neurons are basically connecting right through axons and dendrites to other neurons and. I believe that plasticity or that capability to do that also drops off with age. So yep. if, and, and whether, and again, I, off the top of my head, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't know if that's, you know, it would make sense that to me right now, the way we're talking about this, that, yeah, that if you, if you have a drop off in that, then you, your long-term memory would, would go and other issues. And, and then it would make sense that if you're promoting this synchronization, you would stimulate the neurons to reestablish those connections and basically, you know, rebuild. Um, and that would be in that, and, and that rebuilding would, you know, would, would improve cognition because now you yep. establish those connections that you, that you lost. Um, and maybe there's a point where it's too late, right? Where you've lost too many of these connections. So essentially the neurons now can't find their partners, right? So maybe if you have s still a certain small amount of these connections, then you can rebuild right those branches again, mm. um, and that might be that might be the more long term effects of gamma entrainment right that you that you reestablish more of these connections. But there could be there could also be shorter term you know like the lymphatic system, like in the short term you're basically clearing out damage, but then the long term is that you're rebuilding these connections, and and then and then that would be. Uh, you know, then that would be a much more longer lasting effect. That would mean that once yep. you now stop this therapeutic approach, once you've regained, you know, a certain amount of neuronal connections, then you can basically back to a more normal level of functioning. Right? Yeah. And I kind of, this, this data all suggests to me that may, there may be something more than just the connections themselves, but also the, for lack of a better word, the health of the connection. So, the, the, the synchronization thing in particular just makes me, and realizing that your, your your brain cells seem to want to synchronize with each other because a healthy young brain seems to have, you know, these strong waves, right, that we can mm -hmm. detect. And these older diseased brains have, you know, weaker waves that are uh, lower power, way harder to detect them. And that suggests that the, whatever mechanism they're using to synchronize, and this is something that it sounds like maybe we don't know the answer, like how exactly are they synchronizing? Like what is their the mechanism by which they get their clocks in sync, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever is happening here, it seems their the clocks are getting out of sync, and may, maybe that has to do with not only where the connections are, but are those connections healthy? Like you know, you have these axons and dendrites and whatnot reaching out and connecting to each other, but perhaps there is a diseased state of those where you still have the connection, but it's you know not healthily transmitting somehow, and you're not getting that. And that's resulting in poor synchronization. That poor synchronization is then more resulting in more and more downstream effects. Uh, so, so just like along with neuroplasticity, maybe we also need um, the ability to have you know, healthy connections, not just connections at all. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is people traditionally, as I understand it, think of these connections as one or zero, like it's on or off, right? You either have a connection or you don't have a connection. But maybe this is actually a gradient where you can have a good connection, you can have a bad connection, you can have a strong connection, you can have a weak connection. You can have a connection that's got good synchronization. You can have a connection that's bad synchronization, um, and all these things perhaps play a role in, you know, disease states and aging and all those things. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely, you know, keep going down and down. There's could be much much more. Com there's obviously much more complexity to this, um, and you know, yeah. and then and then once I start getting once once I start jotting down all those notes and thinking about all the other variables that you know that still need to be kind of, um, you know, highlighted or figured out, um, I'm still heartened by saying, well, you know, then <laughs> again, works. then again, you know, even with the crude, the, the, you know, the, the lack of depth of our knowledge fundamentally and the crudity of the approach, it, we still get a significant improvement, That's <laughs> which, right. is, which is pretty <laughs> damned impressive, you know, so, so yeah. there, that, that must mean, you know, it's just like that, that, that mouse model that we, we looked at, you know, um, Micah, with 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 uh, expressing kind of sort of crudely, right? The you know the Yamanaka mm -hmm. factors and and saying, well, I'll be damned. It it you know despite it, did despite, it still did something positive, right? So that me must mean that yeah. that there's there's you know a lot of room for improvement here if we really do it the right yeah. way. So I, I kind of see this approach in the same light. Is like 
well, despite not knowing all of this stuff, you know, and, you know, any, you know, missing one of these pieces could have caused this whole, like, you know, this whole endeavor to go down in failure, yet it didn't. So that must mean mm -hmm. that, 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 um, that there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know, robustness to it that, uh, that yep. we, we, you can, you can still get it almost right, but it, it'll, it'll work. And, and so, so yeah, I mean, to me, that's, that's really promising. Yep. I feel like we're, we're cavemen. We're banging rocks together and we get fire. We have no idea how fire works or any of that, but, but damn it, we can bang rocks together long enough and we'll get some fire. Um, you know, future men will eventually figure out matches and lighters and much more efficient ways to get fire. But, you know, as long as we're able to get that fire, that's the most important thing. And I'm a big fan of that approach generally to aging because I do think that biology is way too complicated. I think if if in order to cure aging or address age-related diseases, we need to solve and fully understand all of human biology, I don't think any of us are going to make it. Like, I think that's basically an impossible battle. It's just way too complicated. We have so much that we don't know. <clears throat> Whereas if we have the, can come up with therapies that work, it's good enough. You know, like mm -hmm. the OSKM, you know, we don't need to know every single gene regulatory network that is, you know, turned on and off throughout the whole process if OSKM works. You know, we can just optimize that and make it good enough. And then hopefully in the future, we'll get better at it. Just like those cavemen banging rocks, eventually we got matches. But, you know, for now, I think banging rocks is the way to go. And, you know, yeah. if in tra yeah. brainwave entrainment has a positive effect, you know, let's just focus on that. Don't worry about, I mean, it's cool to understand why, but I don't think it's nearly as important as just having a therapy that works. Yeah, a good, I mean, a good analogy here to, to make, if I, if I may be so bold as to interject, would be to uh, remind everybody of the Victorians and electricity. Um, they didn't actually know how electricity worked or why it worked. They just knew how to use it. So uh, it didn't stop them building a vast empire that spanned three quarters of the globe and uh, powering their streets with lights and yep. and all those sorts of things. They didn't know everything. They just knew enough. So I think I think this the whole caveman making the fire analogies uh, it, it is is pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure about aliens, uh, Mika. Um, maybe. Um, it's it's the it's the engineering principle of a black box, right? Like you don't in yeah. some, many cases you don't need to know what's in the black box. You just know, you need to know the inputs and outputs. As long as you know, know, know you, as long as you know exactly what the outputs are when you do these types of inputs, then you can put put it off for another day. What's inside that black box? Yeah, yeah. This is it. This is it. Um, so it's it is very very much an engineering approach. Um, yeah, I, I think aging will be eventually fully understood. And uh, computa uh, computational tools are, are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, you know, AI, etc., is 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 also going to speed up that understanding. Um, but yeah, we 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 probably like Aubrey has often said, Aubrey de Grey has said, we don't know everything we know uh, need to know about aging, but we probably know enough to start doing stuff. So you know, the the yep. history is replete with examples of like the Victorians with their electricity. History is replete with many examples of technologies and things like that where people used them, but they had no idea how they worked or why they work they just they just work yeah. you know so yeah so uh, there we go so I'm, I'm i'm fairly positive about things like oskm and we've also got to remember that we might not know exactly what we're doing but our cells do and if they're provided with the correct environment they'll just do the voodoo that they do they don't they don't really need us to to to, to deal with it which is why you know, they're so good. Hmm. So there you go. I, I'm going right. to keep it positive because it's Friday. Okay. So, you know. Awesome. So very, very, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of important concepts here. Um, lymphatic system, kind of a new anatomical discovery from 2012. You know, it's one of these things where I say this in a positive way. When you read the paper, you're like, man, I thought we discovered this in like 1940, 1950. We just discovered this in 2012, right? Um, that sort of that sort of the other paper that reminded me of this is when when uh, discovery of uh, was it what bacteria was that that caused ulcers? Um, that was in the late 1990s. Um, anyway, it's one of these things where it's like really, it's like it wasn't stress all along. It was a bacterial infection. We should have figured that one out in like 1920, not 1999. <laughs> um, so, but but anyway, there you go. Uh, so there's still 
important discoveries, fundamental discoveries, you know, to be made. Um, Wait, hang on. And anatomy. ulcers are caused by a bacteria? That's all uh, they are? Bacterial stomach, infections? Certain stomach ulcers, yeah. Wow. Um, it's what, oh. what is what is the um, what's the and 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 the guy who dis the guy who discovered it proved it. They basically they, none of his colleagues believed him, but you know he he did he did the he did the uh, last resort experiment, which is basically taking a glass of that bacteria and drinking it, and then getting getting a severe ulcer. Um, and then like, antibiotics cleared it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was um oh man, I'm I'm blanking on the bacteria. Um, it's very it's very famous now. Um, okay, interesting. I didn't know. That. Yeah, um, maybe not all ulcers. I'm sure there's 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 other ones, right? But uh, but but yeah, but but a lot of a lot of them are caused by um, uh, by this particular bacteria. Um, wow. So there we go, and uh, another another great example, a uh, historical example of things what work, but we don't know why. Um, scurvy um, and English sailors. Uh, British sailors uh, eating uh, citruses, uh, limes and lemons, um, and it, it was found to actually stop scurvy on long uh, long journeys. They had no idea why, but they just know that it worked, and that's why you Americans mm -hmm. call us limeys. Mm -hmm. H. pylori, that's <laughs> the name of the bacteria. Just look Although up. I haven't heard limey in a long time, but I understand in some parts of the U.S. they still they still say limey. Uh, yeah, maybe if you got in the U.S. it is limey. Maybe if you got a time machine and went back to a seaport from the early 20th or late 19th century. <laughs> I've heard limeys. I've heard people call us limeys um, in recent times. Oh. So it's it still does persist. Um, uh, you mostly call us Brits, I suppose, most of the time now. But yeah, but you had no idea that vitamin C was to do with uh, scurvy. And yet, there you go. Another example of we don't know why, but we know it works. Okay. Has anyone done brainwave entrainment with uh, deep brain stimulation? Um, when so I short answer is I don't know. For obviously, obviously okay. they want to want to go into the more non-invasive approach. But when they first did sure. these studies with mice, um, they they used they used the more invasive um, electrode stimulation to do the 40 hertz, and they used an op okay. then, they, then they switched to some optogenetic approach where they flashed light on the neurons to stimulate them. Uh, and then they moved beyond that, and then they said, "Well, let's see if we can do it through sensory neurons, like non-invasively, and that worked as well." So you know, but um, in, but, in, in so, those yeah, cases, the, the early ones the, were invasive, yeah, with mice. Did the non-invasive ones work just as well as the invasive ones, or was just I, good enough and it was much simpler? I think they. Uh, I want to say they they work just as well, but I'd have to go back to the original okay. paper that was from okay. 2015 or so. Yeah. All right, so um, that concludes, I believe, our journal club um, that covered a lot of bases here. Um, usually we kind of zoom in on the molecular stuff and don't spend so much time on anatomical features, but um, thought this is a great paper to introduce the lymphatic system if you haven't heard of it. Um, very recent discovery, 2012. Um, and I predict once the glymphatic system is involved in some sort of a therapeutic that proves to be efficacious and all eyes then end up on the glymphatic system in in that regard medically that there will be a nobel prize um for the discoverers much like the crispr cas9 system so although i do think that probably the original discoverer of crispr cas9 probably should have shared in the nobel prize but that's just my two cents um let's see what happens here all right, guys. Well, um, I believe we will be having our next journal club sometime at the end of April. Is that correct? That depends on you, doesn't it? <laughs> that, depends that, on me. That, that, that hinges entirely upon you. Okay. Um, so um, if, yeah. if you, if you, if you uh, say, oh, well, let's do it at the end of April, then we will do it at the end of <laughs> April. Um, it's, it's that simple. Your wish is my command. I am your genie in a bottle. I'm All not right. singing the song. Journal Club every week. No, not every week. Every week. No, just kidding. Yeah, Fat Fatma's muted and staying muted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, all right. So, stay tuned. Sometime later in April, um, we will have our next journal club.
and um, yeah, we we will we will see what we'll see what we'll discuss. I don't know. Maybe they'll. There's usually something. Always, I'm reading journal articles, and then then something comes out very recent. I'm like, okay, we're gonna do this because it just came out, hot off the presses. And this is kind of like this paper here that came out very recently. So, so I don't know. I'm looking at some papers now, but um, I might pivot, you know, at the last moment if something kind of really cool comes out. Um, but I'll try to give us long kind of leeway as, as, you know, lead time as possible for everybody to, to read. Okay. Good. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.